They called it the Screamin' Jimmy, and for good reason. Fire up a Detroit Diesel 671, and the sound that erupts from its exhaust stack isn't just noise. It's a mechanical war cry that could wake the dead three counties over. This engine didn't just run, it announced its presence with the subtlety of a freight train. But here's what made truckers, mechanics, and boat captains swear by this howling beast for over five decades. It simply refused to die. Nowhere was that staying power more legendary than in the fleets of GMC big rigs, where drivers routinely racked up hundreds of thousands, sometimes even a million miles before ever needing an engine overhaul. During World War II, tens of thousands of 671 engines powered American landing craft, including the famed LCVP Higgins boats, as well as other military vehicles and equipment across multiple theaters of battle. They started in Arctic cold, ran in tropical heat, and kept running when salt spray, sand, and enemy fire tried to stop them. If the 671 could survive Normandy Beach, your local delivery route wasn't going to phase it. But was this reputation for bulletproof reliability actually deserved? Or just trucking folklore that grew taller with each retelling? The truth, as it turns out, is more complex than the legend, and far more interesting. The Detroit Diesel 671 was a revolutionary breakthrough, as it was the first commercially successful lightweight two-stroke diesel engine in the world, and AND was introduced with a family approach, in lines with one, two, three, four, and six cylinders, based on interchangeable parts. This design philosophy provided a major technical breakthrough for its time, dramatically simplifying manufacturing and field service. The trucking industry needed diesel power that could match gasoline engines for weight and size, while delivering the fuel economy and longevity that only diesel could provide. The 71 designation came from the engine's displacement per cylinder, exactly 71 cubic inches. With six cylinders, the 671 displaced 426 cubic inches. But displacement alone didn't tell the whole story. This was a two-stroke diesel, meaning it fired on every revolution of the crankshaft instead of every other revolution like a four-stroke engine. The engineering was elegantly simple. Each cylinder measured 4.25 inches in bore with a 5-inch stroke. The mechanical unit injector system eliminated the complexity of high-pressure fuel lines and injection pumps that plagued other diesels of the era. Each injector was a self-contained unit that could be replaced individually in minutes, not hours. The 671's secret weapon was its roots-type blower, not added for performance but as an absolute necessity. Two-stroke diesels can't draw in fresh air on their own like four-stroke engines. The roots blower, mechanically driven from the crankshaft, forced fresh air into the cylinders while simultaneously scavenging exhaust gases, creating the distinctive high-pitched whine that earned the engine its Screamin' Jimmy nickname. The engine used a dry liner design. The liner was pressed directly into the block, and heat was transferred from the liner into the engine block, which was then cooled by the circulating coolant. Though replaceable, dry liners typically required significant disassembly to access and remove. It had a single cast iron cylinder head that spanned all six cylinders. Removing it provided full access to the pistons, valves, and liners for service. Thanks to the two-stroke design, there were no intake valves. Intake air flowed through ports in the cylinder walls uncovered by the piston's movement. And each cylinder had two exhaust valves operated by a simple cam and rocker system. This wasn't high-tech by modern standards. No computers, no sensors, no electronic controls. Just pure mechanical muscle. The engine's construction reflected Detroit Diesel's philosophy of building for the real world. The crankcase was a massive cast-iron structure that could absorb tremendous stress without cracking. But the crankshaft was forged steel, not cast, and balanced to tolerances that allowed smooth operation, even at maximum RPM. Each connecting rod was individually fitted and balanced, a level of precision that was unusual for industrial engines of the era. The fuel system represented a masterpiece of mechanical engineering. Each unit injector operated independently with its own mechanical plunger 
eliminating the need for high-pressure fuel lines or separate injection pumps. When an injector failed, a mechanic could replace it in under 10 minutes with nothing more than a socket wrench and a torque wrench. The governor system was equally robust. A mechanical flyweight governor controlled engine speed through direct linkage to the fuel racks with no electronic components to fail or drift out of calibration. The system was so reliable that many 671s operated for decades without governor adjustments, maintaining precise speed control under varying loads. When World War II erupted, the 671 found itself thrust into the most demanding proving ground imaginable. The U.S. Navy's LCVP landing craft, the famous Higgins boats that stormed the beaches of Normandy, relied on 671s to deliver Marines and soldiers through surf and enemy fire, starting instantly in the pre-dawn darkness of D-Day and running even when shrapnel punctured cooling lines. Other armored vehicles, haul trucks, and stationary military equipment used the 671 to operate in mud, snow, and the choking dust of bombed-out cities. Arctic operations in Alaska and the Aleutian Islands tested the engines to their limits, with tugs, barges, and other naval support vessels relying on 671s that had to start at temperatures below minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit and run in conditions where salt spray froze instantly on contact. The military's experience with the 671 created a generation of mechanics and operators who understood the engine's capabilities intimately. When these veterans returned to civilian life, they brought with them knowledge of an engine that had proven itself under the most extreme conditions imaginable. This wartime pedigree became a powerful selling point in the post-war boom years. Uh, the post-World War II economic boom created the perfect environment for the 671 to dominate American highways. Trucking companies were expanding rapidly, Interstate commerce was exploding, and operators needed engines that could handle the punishment of long-haul freight service without breaking the bank on maintenance. The 671 delivered power in a way that perfectly matched trucking's needs. Peak torque arrived at just 1,200 revolutions per minute, meaning drivers could lug heavy loads up mountain grades without constantly shifting gears. The engine would pull from barely above idle to its 2,100 RPM redline with a flat torque curve that made driving easier and more efficient. The engine's power characteristics were particularly well suited to the transmission technology of the era. Most trucks used non-synchronized manual transmissions with relatively few gear ratios. The 671's broad torque curve meant drivers could skip gears during acceleration and maintain highway speeds without constant shifting. This reduced driver fatigue and transmission wear while improving fuel economy. Cooling system design reflected the engine's industrial heritage. The radiator was oversized by automotive standards, ensuring adequate cooling even under maximum load in high ambient temperatures. The water pump was gear-driven rather than belt-driven, eliminating a common failure point. The thermostat was a heavy-duty unit designed for continuous operation at high temperatures, and the cooling system included provisions for engine block heaters in cold climates. The air intake system was equally robust. The air cleaner was a massive dry element unit capable of filtering enormous volumes of air while trapping dust and debris that would damage other engines. The intake manifold was cast iron rather than aluminum, providing durability in harsh operating conditions. The entire system was designed for easy maintenance with filter elements that could be serviced quickly in the field. City bus operations became a proving ground for the engine's durability. New York City Transit Authority buses powered by 671s routinely accumulated 300 to 500,000 miles in stop-and-go service before major overhauls. The constant idling, frequent load changes, and urban operating conditions that destroyed lesser engines seemed to have little effect on the Detroit diesel power plants. The Chicago Transit Authority conducted extensive testing of 671-powered buses in the 1960s, comparing them directly with competitors from Cummins and Caterpillar. The results were decisive. 671s required 30% fewer unscheduled repairs and achieved 40% longer intervals between major overhauls. 
More importantly, when repairs were needed, they could usually be completed at the Transit Authority's own maintenance facilities rather than requiring expensive dealer service. Construction applications pushed the 671 into demanding roles. Alice Chalmers bulldozers and Euclid scrapers, frequently equipped with 671s, moved mountains of earth in strip mining operations, running 24 hours a day in conditions that would challenge any power plant. The Manitowoc 4100 crane, powered by a 671, became the backbone of major construction projects across America, lifting steel beams for skyscrapers while operating in temperatures ranging from desert heat to Arctic cold. The mining industry embraced the 671 for applications that demanded maximum reliability. Smaller Euclid haulers and other heavy equipment, powered by the rugged 671 and its V-series relatives, became the standard for open-pit mining operations worldwide. These machines operated in conditions that would destroy lesser engines. Constant dust, extreme temperatures, maximum loads, and continuous operation. The 671's ability to maintain power output despite these conditions made it indispensable for mining operations where downtime meant lost production. Railroad maintenance equipment found the 671 equally valuable. Track maintenance vehicles powered by these engines could operate on railroad tracks for hundreds of miles from the nearest maintenance facility. The engine's mechanical simplicity meant that railroad maintenance crews could perform repairs using standard railroad shop tools and techniques without requiring specialized diesel engine expertise. The tugboat Arthur Foss, built in 1889 but repowered with the 671 in 1954, operated in Puget Sound for over four decades on the same engine. When the boat was finally retired in 1989, the 671 had accumulated over 35,000 hours of operation, equivalent to running non-stop for four years, and was still running on its original block and crankshaft. What separated the 671 from its competitors wasn't just durability, it was the engine's tolerance for operator error and poor maintenance. Drivers who forgot to check oil levels, ran engines low on coolant, or pushed beyond recommended service intervals found that the 671 would usually forgive their mistakes and keep running. This forgiveness factor became legendary among truckers who operated in remote areas where roadside assistance was measured in days, not hours. The engine's diagnostic simplicity also contributed to its reputation. An experienced mechanic could identify problems by listening to the engine's operation, feeling vibrations through the frame, or observing exhaust smoke patterns. No electronic diagnostic equipment was needed, just knowledge, experience, and basic tools. This made the 671 ideal for operations in developing countries or remote locations where sophisticated repair facilities didn't exist. Fleet operators appreciated the 671's serviceability when it came to long-term maintenance costs. Although replacing a dry liner required significant disassembly, including head and piston removal, it could be done as part of an in-frame rebuild without pulling the engine. Many 671s underwent multiple in-frame overhauls during their service lives, with new liners and pistons restoring performance while retaining their original blocks and serial numbers. The aftermarket parts industry that developed around the 671 was unprecedented for a diesel engine. Independent suppliers offered everything from pistons and rings to complete cylinder heads, often at prices significantly below Detroit Diesel's factory parts. This competition kept maintenance costs reasonable and ensured parts availability even in remote locations. Training programs developed around the 671 created a generation of mechanics who understood two-stroke diesel technology intimately. Detroit Diesel's factory training courses were considered the gold standard for diesel engine education, and mechanics who completed these programs were highly sought after by fleet operators. The knowledge and skills developed around the 671 became transferable to other Detroit diesel engines, creating a loyal customer base that stayed with the brand for decades. By the early 1980s, the trucking industry was changing in ways that would ultimately doom the 671. The 1973 oil crisis had fundamentally altered the economics of trucking, making fuel efficiency a critical concern rather than a minor consideration. Environmental regulations were tightening with each passing year, 
demanding cleaner emissions than two-stroke engines could easily provide. The Clean Air Act of 1970 and subsequent EPA regulations created emission standards that became increasingly difficult for two-stroke engines to meet. The deregulation of the trucking industry in 1980 intensified competition and forced operators to focus on total operating costs rather than just initial purchase price. Fuel costs, which had been a minor consideration in the 1960s, became a major factor in fleet profitability. The 671's fuel consumption, while acceptable in an era of cheap diesel, became a significant disadvantage as fuel prices rose throughout the decade. Competitors like Cummins with their Big Cam series and Caterpillar's 3406 engine were delivering comparable power while consuming 15-20% to 20 less fuel and producing quieter operation. The Cummins NTC 400, introduced in 1976, could match the 671's 400 horsepower output while burning significantly less fuel per mile. For a long-haul truck covering 100,000 miles per year, this fuel savings could amount to thousands of dollars annually. To combat this rising competition, Detroit Diesel launched the Series 92 in the late 1970s. Essentially a bored-out 71 Series engine with a displacement of 92 cubic inches per cylinder, the 92 Series models like the 8V92 and 6V92 offered more power in a lighter package than the massive Cummins and Cat four-strokes. They allowed Detroit Diesel to stay competitive throughout the 1980s, especially with the introduction of the Silver 92 model, but they ultimately shared the same fundamental two-stroke design limitations in noise and fuel consumption as the 671. Detroit Diesel recognized the threat and responded in 1987 with the Series 60, their first four-stroke highway engine. The Series 60 incorporated electronic fuel injection through the Detroit Diesel Electronic Control D-Deck system, precise timing control, and advanced combustion chamber design that delivered fuel economy the 671 simply couldn't match. The Series 60 also featured a wastegate turbocharger that provided better power delivery and fuel economy than the 671's mechanical blower. The fundamental physics of two-stroke operation worked against the 671, the scavenging process that made the engine so powerful also meant that some unburned fuel inevitably passed through the engine, creating visible smoke and higher emissions than four-stroke alternatives. As noise ordinances became more common in urban areas, the Screamin' Jimmy's signature sound became a liability rather than an asset. The transition wasn't immediate. Many fleet operators who had built their businesses around 671 reliability were reluctant to abandon proven technology for unproven alternatives. Some operators continued purchasing 671-powered trucks well into the 1990s, particularly for specialized applications where the engine's unique characteristics provided advantages. Owner-operators in particular remained loyal to the 671 longer than fleet operators. Many independent truckers had learned to maintain and repair these engines themselves. and the lower initial cost of 671-powered trucks made them attractive to operators with limited capital. The engine's reputation for longevity also appealed to owner-operators who planned to keep their trucks for many years. By the mid-1990s, the 671 had largely disappeared from new truck production. Detroit Diesel continued manufacturing the engine for marine and industrial applications, where its unique characteristics still provided advantages. But the highway trucking market had moved on to quieter, cleaner, more efficient four-stroke power plants. The final Detroit diesel two-stroke highway engine, the Series 92, rolled off the production line in 1995, ending an era that had lasted nearly six decades. <laughs>